I'm Barnabas Calder and I'm here at the St Giles Hotel in central London, one of the great brutalist buildings of the 1970s, to give a talk about uh, brutalist architecture in the Chesterton's art series. Uh, thank you very much to Chesterton's and St Giles Hotel for hosting this event. Uh, we couldn't really hope for a better building to be deep beneath than Ellsworth Sykes and Partnerships, uh, 1977. Uh, YMCA building as it was originally, St. Giles's Hotel as it is now. And I think it's a superb place, including being deep beneath it, as you'll see, to think about a style of architecture that's been through its major downs in recent decades, not so much in the way of ups. And it's finally, precariously, starting to make some significant progress towards uh, its first up since it was all brand new. The great projects of the 1960s and 70s were so big, so bold, so unbothered about looking like older buildings that when this campus for the new University of East Anglia was being built in the 1960s, it came as a thrilling shock. It was first exhibited to the people of Norwich, next to which it stands, in this fine exhibition uh, done in characteristically brutalist rough materials. Uh, and the uh, respectable ladies of Norfolk clearly weren't quite sure what to make of it. <laughs> this was radical architecture for radical young people, not architecture for uh, elderly respectable suburbanites in elderly respectable hats. They would no doubt have had similar doubts about the National Theatre, perhaps the greatest of all British brutalist buildings. Three magnificent auditoria designed by the leading British architect of the decade, Dennis Lasden, working together with famous directors including Laurence Olivier, Peter Brook and Peter Hall, uh, to produce the highest possible standard of architecture for the <coughs> highest possible standard of theatrical productions for old and new dramas. Uh, and this is an amazing moment when these avant-garde challenging figures are being given great big budgets and a great big site on which to do something extraordinary, exciting, completely new. And yet, within years of its completion in the late 1970s, uh, it was becoming angrily hated by a great many people. Uh, it was... On one occasion, its architect, Dennis Lasden, got into a taxi to cross central London and was told by the driver that he was going around a slightly longer way in order not to have to see the National Theatre. <laughs> Lasden had put his entire career on hold in order to produce this building. He took on no new work at all for the great central period of his career, just in order to keep his concentration on this building up. And to be told that, by a taxi driver must have been pretty much the end until the Prince of Wales joined in famously uh, calling it a clever way of building a nuclear power station in the centre of London without anybody noticing. <laughs> it, then, <laughs> it then won uh, a 1989 poll as by far the ugliest building in the country uh, and a cartoonist who liked it uh, proposed that this was the sort of thing uh, that its attackers and critics would like. The attitude became widespread through the 1970s and 80s that as with tea rooms, scones and fudge, oldie worldy was best. What the ladies in hats in Norfolk and the uh, critics of the National Theatre might all have preferred is something like this large Tudor manor house, Speak Hall, uh, on the outskirts of Liverpool, and it would probably now please more people than the fine brutalist hotel underneath which we are. It is undoubtedly a fine specimen of its period, but rating it above the best 1960s buildings is based on a view of architecture that makes it purely an aesthetic matter, like the way that it's perfectly valid to prefer Leonardo to Turner or Turner to Picasso, because this is an exclusively aesthetic decision. That's not the case with architecture. Architecture is at least as much like medicine as it is like art. And I have never come across someone so nostalgic that they long for the days before the soulless dominance of mechanistic antibiotics. I've never come across anyone wishing themselves back in the happy, poetic, uh, 
folksy days of medical vein opening with unsterilized knives. <laughs> the interior in which we sit is not as pretty and picturesque as this house, <coughs> but it's robustly built. It's well lit despite being far beneath ground. It's uh, at almost too comfortable a temperature. The air conditioning is so effective. Uh, and it's very, very different from the architecture of Tudor England, where when a Victorian family moved into this house, uh, they had to do a lot of work even to make it Victorian standard of comfortable. This is one of the many immense heaters that they installed in an attempt to keep anything like adequately warm even in the great thick clothes you associate with Victorians. And you can see why it was so hard to heat. The wood used for the building was new cut oak, green oak, which distorts a lot in its early years. It's held together for the most part, not by proper nails, but by wooden pegs. And you can see that the windows have been patched around their edges to try and stop them leaking air, but that you can see gaps around them where the air clearly still is whistling through. The great scholar Erasmus, who visited England around the time this was being built, uh, complained that English windows were so leaky that it was a major hazard to health. If they didn't do much to keep the drafts out, English Tudor windows were much more effective at keeping out light and views. <laughs> this is supposed to be clear window glass. Look at it. And this is only on pieces of glass maybe four or five inches tall, whereas by the 1960s, it was possible to have a piece of glass that went up through two stories that is perfectly flat and smooth, uh, just in case anybody's not sure what I'm referring to because it's so invisible, this is a single pane of glass rising through two stories at the Royal College of Physicians by Dennis Lasden. And it's held in place not by wooden pegs and wobbly oak, but by perfectly fitting bronze. What had changed in the centuries between shoddy, charming, but shoddy speak hall and extraordinary 1960s quality of building after building after building? The answer is perhaps surprising and almost alarming in the context of last week's report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, because the great hero of this story that made the 1960s so wonderful was fossil fuels. Making an iron nail requires a sustained temperature of over 1,000 degrees. Making and working glass requires a very similar heat. Again, sustained for hours. Both of those are very hard to achieve burning plants and very easy to achieve burning coal or gas or oil. The shoddiness of this Tudor glass is because the expense of firewood made glass making a small industry which therefore doesn't have much of that kind of pace of learning that you get in a big competitive industry. But it's also uh, because the makers were struggling to achieve and sustain high temperatures. When you initially make glass from sand, it's full of the bubbles of air that were around the sand to start with, and you need to keep it up to a temperature of 900 degrees or more, whilst those bubbles very slowly come through the extremely goopy, sort of honey-like, uh, molten glass, make their way to the top and disappear. And only once that's happened over hours and hours of a very high temperature do you get glass without all these blasted bubbles in it that stop you seeing out, including huge ones. They also then have a covered in marks of distortion and marks of tools that have been used to try and quickly manage to s manipulate this difficult piece of only just molten glass into a flat state. Which is really difficult if you're only just managing to get it up to the temperature to melt. So making glass in these periods is wrestling against the intractability of a material that needs to be quite a lot hotter and needs to stay at that temperature for a lot longer, but the wood is too expensive. And the more wood you grow for glass making, the less space you have to grow food. 
So there's a conflict between different types of energy that mean that any heat requiring industry remains pretty limited until coal becomes widely exploited from the 17th century onwards. The contrast to this piece, piece of glass arises from the fact that gas and coal allow not only the glass to remain molten for a long time, but a bath of molten tin onto which you pour the molten glass. And the tin, because it's such a flat material, a molten metal, makes perfectly smooth glass. So you have this incredible amount of heat required to keep this immense tin bath, uh, <laughs> not in the usual sense, uh, immense bath of liquid tin, liquid, and to melt the glass across the top and produce these astonishing quality and quantity of flat sheets. Interestingly, you wouldn't today be allowed to make that, make and use that sheet of glass because the danger to the builders installing it is quite substantial. If, the, if they tap it against something as they're carrying it around, then sheets of glass, broken glass, can land on them from meters above, which obviously has uh, fairly significant implications for them. <laughs> um, so this was a unique high point in the British production of courageous buccaneering glass. The wobbly woodwork of the Tudor period that we find so charming, and rightly so, uh, wasn't chosen to be charming. It was chosen because it did not require intense heat to make it. Wood is a material that you only need labor for and time and space. So you just need to chop it down. You don't need to burn another 30 trees to process it. You just chop down the one tree, and that's your wood supply. Obviously, many times over to make a house this size. But even so, it's a major energy investment, because growing wood is very slow. Growing oak this far north is very slow. Uh, and whilst you're locking up that land to just slowly, slowly grow trees to the size where you can build with them, you're not using it for any of your other forms of energy production. And timber that was used for building could not also be used for firewood. So the heat that's required for cooking, for warmth, or for industrial processes like making terrible quality glass is not available uh, if you're using that wood to build with. And the reason they use wooden pegs rather than nails is because wooden pegs just require the labor to cut them to shape. They don't require the intense heat that's a whole half another tree to make a few nails. The contrast to the building beneath which we sit is immense. The vast amount of energy that goes into making a building like this costs very, very little land space. The, food, the surface of the earth can still be mostly devoted to crop growing because coal mines and oil wells uh, are drilled down from a very small area of land and produce a huge amount of energy that just goes up and up the more you need it. It's where growth in economies comes from. Previously, all economies operated on an energy boom and bust cycle. Uh, and only when you start to have coal do you start to be able to have areas of the economy growing indefinitely rather than crashing again when the fuel price reaches a level that they can't sustain. Cement, that's the core ingredient of concrete for a huge concrete building like this, requires, again, sustained temperatures in the region of 1,000 degrees. And in pre-industrial times, its weaker antecedent, lime, was produced by a week of some poor souls shoveling burning, uh, tiny little nut husks in huge quantities into a furnace. Because nut husks are so small that they have a big surface area to volume ratio and burn very intensely. They're very oily, like the nuts they used to house, so they burn very hot. But then they burn very quickly as well. So then you could need to quickly scoop out all the ash that results and scoop in more nut husks. It's a horrendous job. And it takes perhaps seven days to produce under a ton of lime from uh, well over a ton of starting ingredients. Uh, seven days to set up the kiln, seven days to take it down again. And you only end up with this fairly modest amount of lime. If you were trying to build a building out of it, it would be a completely unimaginable quantity of nut husks you would require. Once you've got coal and a cement factory, there is no challenge at all to scaling it up. The steel that reinforces the concrete, again, a very, very energy-hungry material, a material used for the cutlery and weapons of the elite until coal starts to make it cheap enough 
to scale up to an architectural scale or an engineering scale. So you can have great big overhangs on buildings. You can have as many stories as you like, landing on plain air if you like. Uh, you can have uh, extraordinary levels of structural strength that were never previously imaginable. And the period of fastest growth in energy availability in this country coincides with the brutalist period. I've colored it a convenient, if not very brutalist, yellow. Uh, and you can see the very steep rise in energy levels through these decades in which buildings like the one we're in uh, was going up after a very long period of previous rises. So energy isn't just some kind of proxy for economic activity. If you measured uh, the, uh, the number of a certain article being sold, you would be uh, producing a kind of economic indicator, but energy is more fundamental and more important than what the money numbers say. Energy is what actually does stuff. And so the more energy that's getting used, the more is getting done. And because energy tends to be used more efficiently as it's used in larger quantities, the curve of actual increase of stuff happening is steeper even than the curve of amount of energy getting used. So the period in which brutalism thrived is this astonishing moment where people don't yet realize that there's environmental harm being caused by heavy fossil fuel exploitation, so they feel no guilt about it, but they're totally clear that they are changing the world for the better. So let's look at how the architectural expression of that thrilling state of humanity uh, comes out. Perhaps the greatest example of it in uh, London housing is the wonderful Trellick Tower by Erno Goldfinger, uh, built in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And it shows the extent to which architects were just overwhelmed with excitement about the new things that were possible. The things that have become banal for so many people in more recent years, like the possibility of building high, Things like the possibility of uh, giving ordinary people flats high in a building with sensational views out of, over London, which is made possible by cheap concrete and cheap steel that allows these very tall, very robust structures. It's about concrete, this building. It's covered in expo it, it, it is made of concrete, and concrete is what you see on the surface. The concrete is very carefully worked so that it's beautiful uh, and uh, long-lasting and uh, robust. They're completely proud of the structure, so it shows all over it that it's made of concrete and how it stands up, namely these great walls that run right the way up through the building between flats, sound insulating them and, uh, and providing the solidity that it needs. And things like the bridges that run between the, uh, between the lift tower on the left and the, the housing on the right, these bridges are completely unthinkable in earlier materials. It's an amazing thing to be able to do, to design a completely flat tunnel uh, that, or a flat tube of concrete uh, that isn't arched, it's not very much material in it, it's just a stiff uh, tube for people to walk through uh, that can be repeated on every, th every third floor all the way up. Uh, it supports people's weight. It's wonderfully vertiginous because the glass goes right down to ground level. So as you're walking along it, you get this thrilling moment of vertigo as you see the ground more or less beneath your feet. Uh, but that's the excitement of the period about the possibility of providing this for ordinary people. It's got huge windows in the flats providing amazing views over the whole of London. And it's hugely proud of the servicing. Uh, servicing is something that people now find intensely boring. Uh, we sit in this room and we feel vaguely cross if it's two degrees colder or two degrees warmer than our ideal temperature. Uh, actually, it's miraculous that we're far underground breathing fresh air at a temperature that may not be your choice, but it has been chosen, uh, and that is uh, variable and reliable. Uh, if the power completely went out on this building, we would have an exciting time making our way back to ground level, but we don't give it a thought because we are used to the reliability of lighting, air supply, and um, 
lots of other services that provide us with hot and cold water wherever we want them. Uh, completely new things for working class residents in this period who had previously had an outside lavatory, uh, uh, some, in some uh, earlier periods not plumbed in of course, by this period it was uh, I typically uh, connected to sewerage, uh, but not always. Uh, they had never had a dedicated bathroom in which you could have hot running water. Uh, they had never had a fitted kitchen uh, with reliable plumbing. These are extraordinary, thrilling new things to be bringing people. And the heart of it all is this part of the building up here, which is a boiler house. It's a boiler house for oil, which can be pumped up through this tower and burnt here to heat and, uh, and provide hot water for all of these flats. And this is an extraordinarily exciting thing to be offering ordinary people uh, in uh, 1960s London. And therefore, this is a monument that is one of the most prominent monuments in West London. And it's a monument to providing comfortable conditions for working class people. Isn't that thrilling? Why wouldn't he be proud of it? Why wouldn't the architect, who was very left wing, show it off in this massively proud way? The energy changes of the 1960s were vastly exhilarating to the architects of the period. And it's not just a matter of uh, individual buildings responding in individual artistic ways. These changes seem to promise the possibility of whole new ways of having cities. If you look at a 19th century block in a very dense city like Glasgow here, it looks from the pavement very dense and very heavily built up. But when you get up above it or into the buildings, they all have these huge light wells in the middle because the 19th century conditions couldn't actually provide decent working levels of light at an affordable price without producing masses of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide from gas lighting uh, that meant that it was no longer possible to work there. So you had to very carefully uh, choose how you were going to get light and air into office buildings that were, after all, also uh, very heavily affected by the soot in the area around. And so until the 1940s, all office buildings and residential buildings are shallow enough for natural light to be the main source of light to about 20 feet from the windows, uh, beyond which you just <coughs> don't have any habitable spaces in buildings from before that period because you couldn't light them well enough by natural light. In the post-war period, the energy revolution of ample energy is also joined by uh, new lighting technologies uh, like the fluorescent tube. And this image probably fills you with sort of Ricky Gervais nightmare feelings about uh, claustrophobic, socially claustrophobic offices. But if you imagine the change uh, in a generation from buildings like this where every room had to be quite small and have a window at the end of it, to suddenly being able to have indoor offices that were essentially as big as the client wanted and lit by this extraordinary even ceiling lighting that felt like something out of uh, a later, after all, Stanley Kubrick film. Uh, it is an extraordinary revolution and it changes the whole way you can design the city. So no longer do you need to think about the uh, daylight as the crucial factor and you therefore design all building sizes around that and it determines the scale of the buildings and how they relate to each other, suddenly you can design whatever you want and make it work by pumping the air and the light around it retrospectively. This is the Barbican, one of London's absolute brutalist greats. It's a chop away, a cross section through the arts centre in the middle of the Barbican housing estate. And what you can see is an immense concert <coughs> hall uh, and all sorts of foyers and art galleries and some of the side of the theatre, all squashed beneath 10 storeys of housing in the lower parts uh, and uh, 30 to 40 storeys of housing in the t high towers dotted around it. There is a road running through it there is a, an underground railway running through it. There's a lake above some of it. Why not? Concrete and steel 
and uh, pumped air and uh, electric light mean that you can do th these things wherever you like. You no longer have to think, well, obviously the transport needs to be at ground level and the lake needs to be at ground level and we'll build on the bits of land that remain. All the land can serve as being four different ground levels plus lots and lots of levels of interior. Who wouldn't be excited by that? Who wouldn't see the extraordinary engineering that led to these amazing great big beams above the concert hall supporting this huge void uh, with a sculpture um, courtyard above it onto which you could land any weight you liked of modernist sculpture. It's thrilling and the servicing is a huge part of it. This entire bottom layer with all these immense machines in it is there to pump air around, pump water around, heat water, change the temperature of the air, purify the air and produce in every area of the building comfortable satisfactory living conditions and up through these structural columns that hold up each of the floors and hold up the art gallery on top run also the services that carry these extraordinary comfort conditions around the building. The architects are completely exhilarated about these new possibilities and so are their builders. This is a photo taken by the construction company. You can see they're completely thrilled by the extraordinary kind of uh, exhilaration of the machinery in the Barbican's basement plant rooms. So when you look at these buildings what you're seeing is not some kind of uh, cheap expedient way of producing maximum bog standard housing that no one's excited by. A building like the Barbican, this is the tall towers of it which come to this extraordinary sharp sawtoothed point up those balconies, uh, is an expression of huge excitement at new engineering possibilities, new material possibilities, new servicing possibilities brought by very cheap energy and very advanced high energy industry. And the challenges that they superficially seem to give themselves of standing a tall building on thin legs above a lake are only the surface, scratching the surface, because when you then look at what's going on under the ground, there's several more floors of complexity underneath these multi-story buildings and lakes. Uh, it's an astonishing piece of uh, courageous, uh, high energy in uh, literally and metaphorically architecture. There is no such thing as the ground in the 1960s. You can have as many grounds as you like or none wherever you want them. What an extraordinary and exciting proposition. And their commitment to it goes right down to the details. This is the Barbican uh, again in the Arts Centre. And what you have here is an architecture that refuses to have pretty decoration on it, but instead takes seriously the things it has to have and turns them into something exciting, exhilarating and beautiful. So it has to have a little niche for a speaker. It has to have a vent for the uh, conditioned air to come out of. Um, and I, I suspect that probably is an original fire hydrant, although it's fairly early for it. Uh, I saw Elaine Harwood come in, so she, <laughs> she might know. So <laughs> they also have hose reels in there, so I'm not sure whether they had portable hydrants too. Uh, but if not, that's a good improvisation. Uh, and these are fitted into the concrete in a way that turns them into dramatic moments and that celebrates them because they're new possibilities of high energy architecture. And to do it that way is so much harder than to do it the conventional way of sticking a layer of plaster over whatever you finished up with. So the conventional way of building a building, you put up a structure and that's one team of builders who don't care much about what the finish looks like um, but are decent at getting the steel placed and the concrete put together and then a totally different team will come in and do delicate plaster work over the top of what the, uh, what the services engineers have put into place. If you do it this way round, the serious structural work needs to have a finish that is as perfect as perfect plaster work but it also needs to know, you need to know before you start any building work on site where all the wires will go, where any speakers will emerge. You need to design absolutely everything before anything starts which is a really perverse luxurious way of doing it. Right down to the fact that concrete meeting wooden window frames for example 
the concrete had to be very, very precise because normally if the wooden window frames came, came in from the factory and there was an inch gap above them, you'd just stick some bit more bits of wood in there and plaster over it. If you get the concrete slightly wrong, the windows will never fit. And so the concrete all has to be perfect to these extraordinary precise tolerances, which is massively more difficult and more challenging and more expensive potentially, but more demanding, higher craft than the things that people think of as higher craft architecture. And all this glorious architectural effort is in the service of some really appealing things. This is a foyer at the National Theatre in its original and magnificent state. It's there as free, open space, but indoors. It's n you don't have to be going to the theatre to go there. The intention was always that people would just come in and use it because it's being built at the public expense. Why shouldn't the public come and enjoy it, even if they're not theatre goers? They can come in, listen to a musical performance, not have a coffee, which is nowadays a truly outlandish idea that you could go into a building and sit down without having to buy a pint of coffee. Uh, and there it is, free, open to all, sheltered from the weather, beautifully lit and architecturally absolutely stunning, the new public spaces of the 1960s. And the quality of concrete in this building is truly extraordinary. This is a detail of it. And to get, if you just try and imagine how you would go about turning something as, uh, as messy and sludgy as concrete into corners as perfect as this, uh, where when you pull the wooden molds off, it doesn't break away the concrete as you do so. It's a serious piece of carpentry. It's a serious piece of high-skilled concrete pouring by the workers who, uh, who perform this set of miracles. And it's very, very challenging for the architects too, who uh, propose things like the fact that all of the wooden boards should be sawn to slightly different thicknesses. So that not only do you get this beautiful fuzz when you're up close, but from a distance you see shadows cast between them. It's all lit from quite close too, to produce at a greater distance too this feeling of um, a kind of uh, fuzzy, textured wood, woodiness at all distances. I remember as a small child walking up these stairs thinking, it, it feels like stone, but it looks like wood. What is it? Uh, to which the classic 1980s answer was, uh, it's concrete and it's, it's horrid. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I hope that we're getting back past that. And the quality of this grain is so high because the wood wasn't reused very many times. Every time you cast concrete into wood, a bit of the cement settles into that wooden grain. And that wooden grain was difficult enough to produce in the first place. They uh, dried out the wood first, then they sawed it with a very rough saw, and then they shot blasted it to get that grain to come out really strongly. Uh, and they want that grain to stay. So once they've used the wood twice, the grain is starting to be uh, made weaker by the cement settling into it. And so they chuck the wood out and start again. And there are claims that during the horrendously strike-ridden 1970s building of this, uh, construction of this great building, uh, the carpenters spent their time on strike building furniture out of the rejected <laughs> woodwork. If anyone can ever track some down, I will uh, pay almost anything up to and including uh, organs uh, for a piece of it. So this is a level of craft that is comparable with any of the great architectural crafts of the past. It's far above any of the hokey, awkward pseudo-crafts that people are semi-cobbling together for Speak Hall, which is lovely, but lovely because it's awful. This is an extraordinarily high quality. This makes Baroque plasterers uh, look uh, not superior. So what you have is these extraordinary buildings emerging for a huge range of purposes, whole new purposes as well. No one had ever considered building a national theatre on this scale before. It's only in the amazing energy wealth of the post-war period that anyone thinks that a building this size, which will then, after all, only increase the amount of subsidy you need to give it over the following decades, 
uh, would be a good idea. The original proposal for the National Theatre, which is a 19th century one, is that it should be paid for by the rich who, would, who are the kinds of aesthetes who pride themselves on sponsoring theatre. Uh, it's only in the post-war period, uh, immediately after the war, a million pounds is voted to pay for this building or to subsidize this building with the rest of it still to be collected from the public. And that's under the immediate post-war Labour government. And by the 1960s, the assumption has quietly become that the local government, the London County Council, and the national government will pay half each. And the, uh, with this starting off with a one million pound budget, uh, the, they agree at an early meeting that we won't look at the budget until we've designed the perfect building and then we'll fundraise for it from government. And so they design a building that at its earliest, cheapest estimates uh, was over eight times the cost. In fact, the first thing they propose is uh, 13 million pounds uh, and includes an opera house. It was originally intended to be um, two auditoria shared between Sadler's Wells Opera and the Old Vic Theatre Company who would merge into it. Uh, and over the course of the design process, they turn it into uh, five auditoria um, for the two companies not merged at all, but expanded onto the new site. Uh, so it just gets more and more extravagant in its brief and half of it ends up going up. The Opera House gets dropped and the National Theatre is still there to this day. And this could not have happened in, a, in the period of Speak Hall when even the richest people in the area could only get together a few pretty clumsy village carpenters and some uh, really top quality glass makers in the sense that they were glass makers at all. Uh, and that was a rarity uh, to cobble together their, their awkward house. So, this was a period when guilt-free, cheap energy changed everything through cars, through new building materials, and through new building services, and produced a period of architecture so overexcited by these extraordinary new conditions that you can still feel when you look at these buildings the exhilaration, the thrill, uh, and the total confidence of the architects. And the fact that it fell into hatred in f subsequent decades is to do with the fact that it's so strong that you, couldn't, you can't feel neutral about it. You either love it or you really hate it. So when it went out of fashion, it went mightily out of fashion. But I hope that you in this room are typical of the fact that this is now coming increasingly back to be loved but it's still in massive, massive danger. This period of architecture, even when it's listed, is vulnerable to a level of changes and attacks that are completely unlike any earlier period of architecture. Two-star listed buildings like the Commonwealth Institute uh, can be essentially demolished. There's almost none of the Commonwealth Institute left and they haven't even removed the two-star listing for the tiny bits they've kept. It's completely disgraceful. Historic England uh, is not holding the line and defending these listings and uh, local councils are equally allowing terrible, terrible decisions to be made. And the great hope against this terrible uh, movement of bad changes and demolitions is the 20th Century Society. So if you aren't a member of the 20th Century Society, please give very, very serious thought to joining it because it fights mightily and impressively and hard to save this wonderful period of architecture against what feels at times like a completely unwinnable war um, by the property market against it. So, on that exciting note, uh, we can take questions. Thank you very much.